Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. My guest today is a specialist in urological and gynecological pelvic pain disorders. She treats women suffering from pelvic pain and is here to share her experience and expertise with us on this subject matter. Please welcome Dr. Sonia Balani. Thanks for having me. So, you know, from my understanding, the majority of physicians and people who go into OBGYN, they want to specialize either in the obstetrics part or the gynecology part, but you kind of carved your own path and went from residency into treating patients, especially women with pelvic pain. So tell me about your journey and how and how you specialize in both of those areas. Yeah, I know. So first of all, thank you so much because I am really honored. That was such a nice introduction. So I actually did my residency at your stomping grounds here at New York Presbyterian Cornell. And there was a doctor named Dr. Ledger who really kind of pioneered the field of vulvodynia and pelvic pain. And so as I would see patients with him, I would realize a lot of these patients have bladder-based symptoms. And as GYNs, we weren't apt to take care of that part. We were always like, okay, well, we'll send you over to urology and they'll deal with that part. And so patients were kind of getting sent around from GYN to urology to pelvic rehab, and it was frustrating them. And they were like, I'm not really able to understand this as as a whole body kind of a thing. So as that went on, I ended up contacting Robert Moldwin, who is a pioneer in the field of interstitial cystitis and pelvic floor work. And I became his fellow in the Department of Urology. And when I finished my fellowship, he said, why don't you stay on and become my partner? So I stayed in academics for about eight years and worked with both men and women, which is very weird for a GYN, but just kind of the nature of what I did with pelvic floor disorders, um, bladder-based symptoms, and of course, vulvar symptoms. So in terms of training, after you did your residency in OBGYN, was there additional training in urology? Is it a whole new residency or how did that work? I just did a full fellowship. So I did a year long fellowship and then a lot of it, which I was so grateful for, as you know, in academics, when you work within the system, it's just nice to run things by people. So that eight years while I was a partner was really just navigating the whole field as a whole. No, and it's, it's, it's very exciting. You know, having both specialties on your belt is rare and certainly a value add to your patients. So I do want to get into pelvic pain. You know, so pelvic pain is defined as pain below your belly button, in between your hips. It's an important area of the body that houses a lot of organs. It connects your upper body and your lower body, your core, which is something I focus on in the spine world. But sometimes this area can become dysfunctional and it can lead to a number of painful conditions, especially in women. Uh, So you're the founder of Medical Pelvis Pain Doc in New York City and an assistant professor of urology and gynecology at Hofstra Medical Center. Tell us about what is pelvic pain and what are some of the conditions that you treat in your practice? So pelvic pain, as you said, is defined as pain localized in the abdomen, in the pelvis for over six months, which is such a broad definition. Like, what does that even really mean? So I like to break it down into what we call pain generators. And I'm sure you kind of think of different parts of the body in a similar way. So number one, taking a look at where are these symptoms coming from? Are they coming from the vagina, the vulva, the vestibule? Are they coming from the bladder? Are they coming from the pelvic floor? And oftentimes, how is the nervous system related to all of these conditions? So what is that experience like when a patient comes to see you? How do you kind of figure out where it is all coming from? Is it just diagnostics or the history? What's that experience like? It's a lot of peeling the onion. And what I mean by that is when we come in, you take a full history and physical, which oftentimes for my patients will take anywhere up to an hour to an hour and a half. Because we're really trying to elucidate where their symptoms are coming from. More often than not, it's, it's actually multiple different pain generators. So they'll often have conditions called vulvodynia or vestibulodynia in addition to pelvic floor dysfunction. Oh, and by the way, they also have some bladder-based symptoms, and they may have some interstitial cystitis. But it's kind of understanding what the biggest pain generator is at that time. Are most of these patients coming in with some type of traumatic history, or can patients with no history of trauma have these conditions? Patients with no history of trauma can have these, these types of symptoms. And I think it's interesting because when you look at the data... In the past, it was often done on patients who had a history of trauma. But if you actually take a look at, I think, the patients that we see on a day-to-day basis, most don't. You know, one of the conditions you talk a, talk a lot about, and I see it on your website, is female sexual dysfunction. You know, in America, and I'll be the first to admit it, men and women don't have equal access to health care, both politically and through insurance companies and what things are covered. 
And when we think of sexual dysfunction, we think of male sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction. There are commercials for ED pills everywhere. There's advertisements, but we don't really hear about the female version of this. So what is female sexual dysfunction? How do you treat it? How do you diagnose this? And what are things that you can offer? Yeah, and there's so many different aspects to female sexual dysfunction. I think you're right. Number one, the biggest thing is having conversations like this, which normalize it and take away that stigma associated with it. Because if you look at the data, somewhere around seven to 10 women out of like 100 will experience some sort of pain with sex. So um, you can have pain with initial penetration. You can have pain with deep penetration. You can have pain or difficulty orgasming. These are all issues that people kind of kind of put under a rug and say, oh, don't worry about it. But these are real issues. And in fact, they can alter the way people can even function in their day-to-day lives. So this type of pain can continue on. It can become more bladder-based related. And then they have frequency and urgency. And now you're in a cycle. And so now we're trying to kind of figure out how not only are we dealing with female sexual dysfunction, but we're fe- dealing with pain from all different aspects. At even the time. 7 to 10 out of 100 patients that have this, this is probably underreported. You know, Absolutely. patients probably don't know they have this condition or even too embarrassed to talk to someone about it. A hundred percent. It's definitely underreported and misdiagnosed a lot of the time. I'll have so many patients walk into my office and they're like, oh, I told my last GYN about this. She just said to have a glass of wine before we had sex. (laughs) Like, or use a lubricant. And I mean, I while I understand that these are all things that patients can try, oftentimes they're not really going to fix the issue. And it minimizes the issue to a point where patients are scared to actually seek care for it anymore. At what point would you tell someone it's time to see someone to take care of this problem? Maybe the glass of wine didn't work or lubricants didn't work. Are those reasonable initial first steps? So for me, I think that most patients, to be quite honest, know their bodies really well. And I'm sure you see this in your own field as well. So, you know, you have this also this misconception that having pain with sex the first time that you have sex is normal. And it's not, and it doesn't have to be. So if there is any type of discomfort with sexual intercourse, if there's something that just feels off on your body, I definitely would say you should seek care because there's so many different things we can do to treat this. And I think that's the most amazing part is when I see patients walk out of my office and they're like, I just never thought I was going to be able to have a life where I didn't have to think about this area anymore. And you're like, yes, absolutely. This is something that that we could always do. You know what I mean? Presumably many of these patients have spoken to their primary care doc or their OB or even maybe they went to pain management. So do patients often see other providers before they see you and talk to you about this problem? Yeah, for sure. And and I think it's always reasonable to see your primary care doctor or to see your general GYN. But I think if you're not getting the answers that you deserve or that you feel even make sense to you, then it's important to seek care from a specialist. One of the things you talked about in, in female sexual dysfunction is, is pain. And we, we talk about pelvic pain and chronic pain. So vulvodynia is a condition that could affect up to 16%. Again, this is a number reported from the stats, but could be underreported because patients, again, are afraid to confront this condition or speak about it with their partners. Can you explain what is vulvodynia and what's your approach to treating it? Yeah, I love this question because what is vulvodynia? What does that even mean? It means that there's pain in the vagina, vestibule, or the vulvar area. So just anatomically taking a look at the lower vaginal area and dividing it up. And oftentimes for patients, that's difficult because we just think of the vagina as a vagina when in fact there is a vestibule, which is you know, the outer labia, the mons, um, and then we actually have the vagina, which is the inner canal. So vulvodynia, or what we call vestibulodynia, is pain in any of these areas that's not due to things that we can see on exam. For example, infection, vulvar dermatoses. So you want to rule all these things out before you just label a person with vulvodynia or vestibulodynia. If someone has pain, how do they know they don't have one of these infections or things like that? And that's a great point. And that's exactly why seeing your primary care doctor or seeing your GYN first to make sure that we're ruling all of these things out before we just label someone with that this diagnosis. So, you know, if you have gonorrhea or chlamydia or you're diagnosed with lichen sclerosis or lichen planus, then oftentimes you're not actually a patient with vulvodynia. You can have vulvar pain or pain in the vestibular or the vagina, but theoretically you're not necessarily a vulvodynia patient. That's an interesting uh, difference of you could have pain in the vulva, 
but not be characterized as vulvodynia. What is that difference? So when you look at vulvodynia, you can break it down into different what we call etiologies, right? So you can have neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, which is when you have a lot of nerves firing in the vagina or the vulvar area, not secondary to some sort of infection, some sort of allergen or detergent that's causing a change in the skin of that area, because remember, there's just skin there, um, that there's no type of vulvar dermatosis there, and then you break it down into other components, so things like hormonally mediated. So is there something going on that's affecting the hormones in the area that can be causing this pain? So for some patients who are on long-term birth control pills, it actually changes the pH of the vagina and can alter sensations down there. And then for patients who have inflammation, there's often in inflammatory characteristics. And then for, of course, things that you guys see, which is hypertonic pelvic floor dysfunction, which can also be a cause for vestibulodynia or vulvodynia, just where that puborectalis actually inserts right up on the vagina. So kind of like peeling that onion apart, I think is really important to really maneuvering this situation. You know, it sounds like treating vulvodynia is kind of similar to what we do with back pain. You know, there's not one size fits all for back pain. There's many different sources. So how do you go about that? You know, if, if you're a listener and you're a woman suffering from pain in this area, you may think you may not know what to do. It may be an infection. It may be detergents, like you said. It may be birth control that you're taking. So how do you discover and uncover where to start your treatment protocol? And I think this is the most important point is like patients should be empowered of taking control of their care. So first things first, I would ask yourself a couple of questions. One, if you're having pain in the vagina or the vulva, is it constant? Are you always having pain? Does it come and go? Or is it only when you're provoked, i.e., is it come really when you wear tight underwear, when you attempt intercourse, when you put in a tampon? Because kind of dividing these two symptoms up is really important in what we'll do next. And if you see that this is happening more regularly, how often is it happening? Are you oh, Have you had this since you started menstruating at the age of 12? Or did you have pain with intercourse from the first time that you had sex? So understanding if it's primary or secondary is also key as well. Sounds like the history is a big part of this. You know, when you speak with these patients, trying to find some inciting event is very, very important. For sure, yeah. And I think that, that that actually, it's one of the reasons we can do telehealth. Do you know what I mean? Because it's so focused on the history and physical, and you can learn so much from the history and physical that can affect your treatment plan that can make it more successful. You know, in medical school, there was an attending that always said, you know, listen to the patient long enough, and they're going to tell you what's wrong with them instead of jumping in with these pointed questions. How important is the physical exam is, and what does that entail when someone comes to see you in the office? So the physical exam is super important as well. What we do is we start off with what's, what's called a Q-tip test. So we take a Q-tip and we actually map the, the pain sensors within the vagina or the vestibule. So it's interesting to see how some, when you take a, a small little Q-tip and you put it in the vagina or the vulva with someone who had vestibulodynia or vulvodynia will actually feel a lot of pain with this test. This can also help determine if there's any dermatologic changes in the vagina. So oftentimes in the office, I'll do something known as a colposcopy, where you actually take a look at the vagina under a microscope. Because as we said before, it's key for me to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Because treating someone with lichen sclerosis or a dermatologic issue is way different than treating someone with vulvodynia. And as you know, as a physician, it's making that correct diagnosis that sets all of us apart. And then, of course, always examining the pelvic floor musculature. So they say about 70% of patients with vulvodynia or IC also have pelvic floor dysfunction. Because we always ask ourselves, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did you have the pain? Now you're clenching up more. Now we have to treat the pelvic floor as well or, you know, vice versa. You know, being a surgeon, someone might say, you know, do I need to go see a surgeon for this problem? Should I see a different healthcare specialist or pelvic floor specialist? Where do you kind of see yourself fitting in the algorithm of treating pelvic floor dysfunction? I mean, it's something that I think that all of us have studied and is really important to offer patients a full armamentarium of care. So yeah, I absolutely treat pelvic floor dysfunction, and I think it's important to treat it medically, to treat it physically, often with physical therapy. The pelvic floor is still a host of muscles and nerves, so oftentimes people don't realize that you can actually inject the pelvic floor and it can get it to feel better. Not chronic injections, so to speak, but you know, understanding diagnostically how injections work and that's key as well i think what is most important in any of these patients and i'm sure you see this as well is 
making sure that you're treating every aspect of them. So if they have a combination of vulvodynia and pelvic floor, and I'm only treating the vulva, treating the vulva, treating the vulva, they're going to continue to have issues. So they might say, okay, I can now have no pain with initial intercourse, but really positioning wise, I can't have, I am, there's no pleasure there because when we have deep penetration, I have to tell them to stop or, you know, I'm speaking in heteronormative terms, but however, and, and that's key. So if you're not treating the pelvic floor, then you're never really getting to the crux of that stuff. In this day and age of comprehensive care, everyone's looking for a multidisciplinary approach. We do we do a lot for spine pain and back pain, and I'm sure it's no different from pelvic pain. So how do you employ that strategy in pelvic floor collaborations with other specialists and referrals and things like that? So I love working with physiatrists. I love working with pelvic floor physical therapists because I think as a team, we are all able to kind of work on these different parts to get patients better together. So... Um, For me, first and foremost, it's also counseling patients on what's going on with them. I feel like when you're more well-informed about your body, you're able to even implement lifestyle modifications, certain things in your everyday life that you don't realize are actually probably worsening your symptoms. That is so important because ultimately we can get patients better, especially as a team. But what's going to keep that longevity there? And that is all conservative therapies, lifestyle modifications, that kind of thing. I want to go into that a little further because, you know, just like you mentioned earlier, we want to empower patients to take care of their own health. And one of the things that patients can do outside of the clinic visit is lifestyle modifications. You know, something I read recently was about how diet might impact vulvodynia or pain from the vulva. Tell me about that in addition to other lifestyle modifications that some of our listeners could could implement. Yeah, it's interesting because diet actually has a role in IC, vulvodynia, and pelvic floor, if you look at the data, right? Which is so cool. So I always ask myself, why, how is diet playing a role? So if I took a look at the bladder and diet, for example... Oftentimes people will say to their patients, don't have anything spicy, no caffeine, no acidic foods, essentially all bladder irritants. But ultimately, if you take a look at at patients who have vulvodynia or pelvic floor, it's similar foods that tend to be triggers. Why? And we often believe this is secondary to inflammation. So there's often this inflammatory response within the pelvis, bladder-wise, vulvar-wise, and pelvic floor-wise that can kind of create these tense contraction knots or create these um, firing of the nerves right into the vulva that makes stuff worse. But... For every patient, that's different. So what might be caffeine for you might be spicy foods for me. So I am not a fan of like handing patients a list and saying, just stop everything. Because I think oftentimes then you don't know what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? But I really like the elimination diet. Let's say you say, you know what? Every single time I eat an orange, I'll notice that my pelvic pain, and I'm not sure where it's coming from because it's often hard to kind of elucidate that. Every time I have an orange, my pelvic pain gets worse. Okay, well, let's try and take away the orange at least for 72 hours, but keep all your other foods that you like and you think are good. Let's say in those three days, you say, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit better. In, in, of course, you have to do like a two-week washout period, but fine, whatever. <laughs> You're feeling better. Now you add in the orange and you say, mm, getting uncomfortable again. We know that's a trigger. For, you know what I mean? Are there common foods that you do see or common elements of person's diet that can contribute to vulvar pain? One of the big things that we talked about in vulvar pain is a high sugar diet. And that's really because it can often confuse a situation because yeast like sugar. And so if that, if you're having multiple different yeast infections, but you're being misdiagnosed and you're having pain in the vulva, we don't know where it's really coming from. But sugar is also inflammatory in nature. So it's just interesting how all of these things kind of work together. You know what I mean? I think it's hard to, like I said, kind of give everyone like a one-shot deal, but understanding that sugars can play a role, oftentimes irritants can always play a role as well. It's fascinating to me listening to you speak because I specialize in, in spine pain and back pain. And for me, that's tailbone and up. And for pelvic pain, it's kind of the opposite, tailbone and below. But our approaches are very similar. You know, I say low carb diet, low sugar, because it's pro inflammatory. We say let's look at the muscles and the nerves and the etiology of pain. So, you know, it's fascinating to me because I'm so it's this is a foreign area to me, and I'm in, I'm admitting that I don't know much about female sexual dysfunction or vulvodynia, which is 
why it's important for me to know specialists like you who can help me treat this patient. You know, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the perspective of a listener, someone who might have pain in the genitals or, or vulvodynia pain, and I don't know where to go. How do you speak with your partner about this? Where should I first target? Where can I learn about this and seek care if I need it? Yeah, and this is so important. So number one, I think that it's tough because as physicians, we're always like, be careful with Google (laughs) because you can often get a ton of misinformation on there. So I think, I mean, often there's a lot of groups like the National Vulvodynia Association, the Interstitial Cystitis Association, ISHWISH, a lot of groups that actually post real data-driven recommendations on this. I try to do so in my own kind of what I put out there as well, because I think it's so important. And I think starting there is key. And in terms of discussing this with your partner and even your doctor, I find a lot of people feel like they can't mention everything. Or I'll have a lot of patients preface what they tell me with, so TMI, but, and I'm like, no, not TMI. <laughs> none of this is TMI. All of this needs to be discussed out in the open. In fact, even in my office, I often have partners come in with the patient because it's really key for them to understand Oftentimes it's positional and they say, you know, I want to get started with having intercourse, but my partner really likes this position, but I prefer that. And it's often just hearing it from me like, no, look, there's scientific reason that this is happening because this muscle and this area of the vulva is really what's sensitive. So try this for a little bit. And I mean, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but it's not. How do, how do we destigmatize this discussion? You know, with males, you go into your doctor and say, I have erectile dysfunction. He's like, here's some pills mm-hmm. or here's some feedback strategies. Mm-hmm. With women, I feel like maybe we're not as comfortable in, in engaging and talking about this conversation. So how do we make that a little more well-known to the public? By doing what you're doing right now. I mean, I think that that is key, putting out accurate information and putting it out even if pe- other people find it uncomfortable. And I know it's one of those things where... We just say, oh, well, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, so I'm not going to talk about sex. Talk about sex. It is normal. We should all (laughs) just hit the desk. I'm getting so passionate about this. We should all be able to have these conversations without shying away because sexual health is involved with all, like your entire body. I mean, cardiovascularly, everything. It's important. So we should not be looking at it as like one part of a person, but really looking at it as like, this is important for all of you. I really respect that. You know, just like the spine relates with the entire body, the pelvic is not separate from that. It's it's completely tied in. And your expertise with both urology and gynecology sounds like it's very important because if you miss the bladder involvement causing pelvic floor dysfunction, you might miss the boat in the treatment strategy. For sure. And we didn't even talk about the bladder much, but oftentimes patients come in with frequency and urgency and it's all bladder, but it's not. I mean, you know this because you do it, but it's not. And so... Then they get put on all of these antibiotics or they get put on, you know, having all this stuff for bladder pacemakers. And they're like, why am I not getting better? Well, wait a minute. It's not actually coming from the bladder, although you have bladder-based symptoms. So it's so key to do that, to understand that. You know, we see in our practice, not not a lot, but patients who come in with either cystitis or prostatitis get put on long-term antibiotics and then develop other problems. Mm -hmm. Then they have tendon issues. And now you're treating the tendon issue because you didn't treat the underlying issue to begin with. Or long-term antibiotics, which then affects the pH of the vagina. So now they're having vulvodynia issues when to start with, they actually didn't even have that stuff. So I mean, it's, it's so interesting. It's completely fascinating. It's so this interesting. Whole part of the human body is very, very fascinating. What are some tips you can give our listeners? You know, it's, it might be difficult to prevent this condition from happening, but if you're experiencing some symptoms, what are some things that listeners can learn to change in their lives that might prevent this from developing? This is probably one of the most important aspects of care. So number one, maintaining a healthy lifestyle is not easy, especially like in COVID and all of that. But understanding how the bowel, the bladder, the vagina, the pelvic floor all play a role and kind of interact with each other. So for a lot of my patients, I'll start with saying, make sure you're not constipated. Hey, it sounds pretty simple, but constipation will aggravate your pelvic floor. You'll clench up more. It can actually cause nerve proliferation of the nerves firing in the vagina. And now you have a whole cycle. So kind of like backing that up so that we don't kind of start on on cycling for any of these things. So constipation is a big one. Something that sounds kind of nutty but really works is warm baths. Muscles love heat. It relaxes the muscles, releases them, and oftentimes that can help to settle symptoms for many patients. 
I love yoga, and I love yoga for multiple reasons, but if you look at why yoga has kind of come into vogue more recently, and especially with pain patients, at least from the pelvic area, you can probably speak to this more for spine, but number one, lengthens the muscles, which is key, decreases cortisol, activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So all of this is so important to just kind of ground you, you know what I mean? I think that's key for me. And then meditation, of course, mindful meditation specifically, but, and there's data on this, which I think is the coolest part of all this, but what happens when you're anxious, when you're stressed? And you, I see this all the time and it bothers me when a patient comes in and they say, oh, well, this doctor just couldn't find out what was wrong with me. So they said it was just kind of all in my head. It's not in your head, but think about what you do when you're anxious or stressed out. You clench your jaw, you clench your pelvic floor. So that can also cause patients to cycle. And so understanding that mind-body connection with meditation, making space to understand kind of what's going on in your body is so key. How do you have that conversation? Because I I struggle with that. And I'll admit that when I can't find an anatomic reason for pain, the MRI looks clean. I've done a number of injections and the patient's still in pain. And I know there is a psychological component to that. And I don't want them to think it's just in your head. So how do you actually have that conversation with the patient? So I actually say that like point blank. I say, like, especially if I can hear from a patient telling me I've done this, I've done that, nothing's worked. I think the key first, first part is figuring out why is nothing working? What are we missing? Because I think as physicians, it's always easy to think I'm not missing anything. It's got to be just, you know, something else wrong. But truthfully, we can be missing a lot of stuff. So kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, and I'll often say to patients, what is the thing if you had to say, Dr. Blani, treat this one thing for me today. I have all this other stuff going on, but this is the one thing I want to go home with. Then that helps me come up with a trajectory, at least a plan. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. So we can get started somewhere. You know, in medicine, we say it a lot. I, I, I admit to saying this patient failed therapy, patient failed injections. And I put the responsibility on the patient, not on the therapy that I'm delivering them. Like therapy failed the patient or my injections failed the patient. So I think implementing and incorporating that kind of mind body is very, very important. So for you, how do you relax? You know, you work in a busy practice, seeing patients a lot and researching. What are some strategies that you employ in your own body to relax and meditate? I'm a huge meditator. And I think this is also because I grew up in like a family where my dad was a big meditator too. So I like using things, even simple things like the Calm app. I mean, it's something that I just did on my way here. I'll do it on the train, just take 10 minutes of my own time to kind of just sit back and say, okay, how am I feeling right now? Am I anxious or am I stressed? How am I meeting those feelings? Because more often than not, it's how we're reacting to things than what's actually going on around us. And I think as physicians and surgeons, we're always good at compartmentalizing. We're always good at saying, okay, this is this, that's that. I'm focused on this right now. But often that can be worse. Do you know what I mean? Because you're just so good at kind of keeping all your emotions away. So that's key for me. I'm a huge runner, Uh, so I I may have to like come and see you now (laughs) because I've been having some back issues, but I love running. To me, it's meditative in a sense. I get all that energy that I have out, and those endorphins really keep me going for the rest of the day. So I wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, and it's something that I just make sure I do. I think I'm a better mother for it and probably a better doctor. And making time for ourselves. As physicians, like we get to do this, which is great, but we're allowed to have our own time. You know what I mean? And I think that we're so used to taking care of everyone else that it feels selfish to say, I deserve this me time. But I always do. Like I always tell my family, my patients, like, look, you're probably not going to hear from me from the hours of seven to nine because I'm just going to take that time to do what I need, unless it's an emergency, obviously, you know, and I think that should be standard. <laughs> just like you said, I think it's, you know, we're, we've been given one body, one mind, and if we want to lead by example. We need to take care of ourselves so we can take care of our patients a little bit better. Um, tell our listeners on how they can find you. Are you still seeing patients? Are you open for new consultations? I know you have a really, really nice website with a lot of educational materials on it, um, but tell us how we can find you. Yeah, you can find me. um, I'm in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, You can find me on the web at www.pelvicpaindoc.com. You can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter with the same handles. And then my office phone number is 212-634-9533. And I am open and seeing patients, obviously taking precautions because of COVID, but I would be honored to help anyone. Well, I certainly learned a lot today. I am, I admit I'm a, a little bit more comfortable seeing my next patient that comes in with some type of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction or pain. Uh, we will definitely share your office contact information and your social media handles with our listeners. 
But Dr. Balani, it was a pleasure. I had a lot Thank of fun today. You. I learned a lot today. That was awesome. Our, and I think our listeners had a good experience as well. Thanks. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D.com.